Welcome to this talk. Um, I am Paul Baxter and I will be talking about social robots today. Um, and in particular, just a brief look at some of the sorts of social robots that you see out in the out in the world in, in terms of sci-fi in the media and so on, and what is actually going on in terms of research. So real social robots stuff. Now, obviously, I, I'm not going to be able to cover every single robot in the existence of uh, uh, sci-fi or even real robots. So um, I'm afraid that if I have left out your favorite robot, then please forgive me, because I'm actually more interested in some of the ideas underlying these um, these robots. What are the things that people assume that they can do um, in terms of social interaction? But then, you know, what can we actually do? What? Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples of the sorts of things that I've been researching, some of my re uh, my colleagues have been have been researching. So reality um, and research of social robots. So I am a lecturer at um, the University of Lincoln, and I'm a member of LCAS. So I'm uh, the Lincoln Center for Autonomous Systems. But my background is in electronics. So I've been working with robots, electronics, and so on for about 15 years. Uh, so I started with um, sort of microchips. Uh, this is an FPGA. And then I moved on to robots, um, small wheeled robots to start with. So very simple little things, two wheels, a couple, uh, couple of sensors on them. And so at the start, I was interested in uh, what's called developmental robotics and this is the idea that you can take some principles from say the way that babies develop uh, or animals develop as they are young and grow older um, with the idea that they gradually over time and experience become more competent at the sorts of things they can do in the real world so the idea is to take some of these principles from nature and to apply them to robots so i was playing around with some of the basic uh, basic developmental ideas, uh, putting them onto these little wheeled robots and, well, basically just watch them bash into walls for a while. But I, I sort of grew in terms of uh, robotics, outgrew the two wheeled robots and moved on to um, slightly more complex robots. But it wasn't really the robots that got me by this stage. Uh, it was the idea that it's not just the physical world that we deal with, it's not just the things that we encounter in the world, like doors, objects, things like that, that are of particular interest. No, the real challenge, the really difficult stuff, the really interesting stuff, as far as I'm concerned, is the way that we interact with other people. So it's the social environment that I'm interested in. And so for that, I needed some slightly more complex robots. And so I do most of my work with uh, this little, uh, my little buddy here called the Now Robot. It's fairly small. Um, and I'll give you a, a brief overview of the sorts of things I do in my research a bit a bit later. But this sort of robot allowed me to look at social interactions. Um, and it's not just robots like that. I've worked subsequently um, with a number of other types of robots, which you might recognize here, including some agricultural robots, for which social robotics is not the obvious um, um, an obvious application, but nevertheless, there's some there's some social robotics principles that go on in there as well. Um, but also some more, I don't know, industrial looking robots, such as the one you can see there on the bottom left. Um, and so that's, I just wanted to give you an outline of, of, of my background to motivate why I'm going to talk about social robots in particular, um, because I'm not going to be talking about sort of robots for automation. So these are the sorts of robots that um, you'll see in factories. So you might see things like this on car production lines. These are robots that operate in very constrained environments. They have a particular job to do um, and they do it repeatedly. They do it quickly. They do it well. But what you don't see in these environments are people. Right? You don't mix the people and the robots. These sorts of robots are likely to be able to take your head off if you stand in the wrong place. OK, and so there's no real mixing. There's no interaction here as such. Yes, some human will come and program them occasionally or reprogram them or fix them or so on, but there's no social interaction as such. Um, in other sorts of warehouses, uh, in other sorts of um, environments, such as warehouses, you might see things like 
this. So this is um, a Kiva robot used in Amazon warehouses, used to fetch and carry um, um, boxes, crates, uh, various deliveries and so on. So there's a high degree of automation going on in here. Now in these warehouses, you might start to see a little bit more interaction with humans, but typically there's uh, some separation involved. But again, there's not so much social interaction, and that even applies to sorts of robots that you might find in your home. So things like um, these um, robotic vacuum cleaners, there are lawn mowers, things of this sort. Again, they, they will operate in the background and people will watch them play with their pets or have pets run away scared or have rabbits sit on them and have a, have a ride around. Um, but they are not really social. You don't shout, well, you probably shout at it, uh, when it goes in the wrong place or it misses that pile of crumbs that you've dutifully put in front of it and it turns away but for the most part it doesn't really well it doesn't uh, interact with you socially back so these aren't really social robots i mean even the incredibly impressive robots that you've probably seen um, videos of online such as the atlas from boston dynamics and you can you see, see some of the amazing um athletics um amazing physical uh, possibilities of these robotic systems. So I'm not going to talk about these because we, we don't interact with them socially, right? They are incredibly impressive devices. I'm not uh, suggesting otherwise at all. I want to talk about basically people and robots. And so talking about social interaction, think about the way in which you speak and interact with people, right? Um, you are speaking to them maybe yes you have a conversation but think about what you're doing while you're having this conversation you are engaging in um gestures so you use your hands your arms your your bodies to help support the things that you're saying you use your eyes to indicate the way um uh, to indicate turn taking for example you can use joint gaze to orient people's attention to a certain object or other person in your environment and so on, right? So there's a huge amount going on here, which goes beyond just saying words to other people, okay? Um, and, you know, there are a series of actions when you're, even if you're not speaking to somebody, if you are walking down a corridor, for instance, and you're passing somebody in the corridor, you will change your behavior as a result of some other person being there. Right? You might coordinate your, um, your subsequent actions by having a glance at the other person. Right? So you have a quick glance at them, um, and you might change the direction you're walking. Right? So you both move over to the sides of the corridors, for instance, or take turns passing a bottleneck, um, and so on. Think about when you're crossing a road. You might make eye contact with the driver before you start to um, use the um, pedestrian crossing. Right? Things like this. These are things that don't necessarily occur to us all the time. So they're um, um, unconscious actions. And yet they're all key aspects of social interaction. And so if we have robots in this sort of human oriented environment, what do they have to do? Right. What do they have to be sensitive to in order for them to be able to interact in a human oriented space to interact with people who are not necessarily experts at robotics which most people are not um, so we need to understand a bit more about social interaction in order to have them interact properly all right interact with uh, in a way that people would be able to handle and so when it comes to the way that people see robots the most experience that people have comes from the media, come from films, come from um, cartoons when you're growing up, come from characters, from sci-fi effectively. Um, and so, you know, what do these sorts of characters suggest to us, right? I mean, we've got the good robots, as it were, right? Things that, uh, you know, th these um, um, artificial agents that interact with people in a very naturalistic way, even if they don't speak, such as Wally. Um, I hope you recognize these because uh, the, the robot on the bottom right is probably one of my main motivators for being interested in robotics in the first place. It is, of course, um, Johnny Five. Um, and so, you know, even if they're not using speech, such as Wally, -E, you uh, they are still able to interact in a way that 
um, that is perfectly natural to us. We are able to interact with them perfectly naturally in a way that we'd be able to interact with other people, right? Um, even if it's a bit stunted in, in, in some cases. Yes, you, you know, you, you come up with, uh, or you see scenarios in these, uh, in these films that, um, that indicate that, that they are not necessarily um, perfect at social interaction, but nevertheless, they're very capable, okay? So the speech, uh, no, so there's, there's even a degree of personality there, which we can relate to as people. Um, so those are the good robots. We have examples of sort of much more neutral robots. Um, I don't know whether you have come across um, the robot from Robot and Frank, um, which um, is where a elderly gentleman takes advantage of a particular care robot in order to do things that are not necessarily allowed. I won't provide any spoilers for those who uh, haven't seen it yet, but it's a, it's a nice little film, so I recommend it. Um, and then something like, uh, like like this, which is Marvin, the paranoid android from Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, and they are, you know, more neutral. But, but again, you see similar sorts of characteristics here. They're able to interact with speech very naturally. Uh, they inhabit the real world. So as robots, they have bodies that they use in a way that is consistent with the way that we use our bodies when we're interacting with other people. There are limitations, of course, and um, uh, and these are usually highlighted in some way, but they're not really limitations in terms of the um, social interaction capabilities of them. But of course, you know, one of the most prevalent um, uh, genres of, uh, of robots in films, of course, are the, are, are the evil robots, right? The ones that take over the world, the ones that kill people, the ones that uh, um, have a more unpleasant side. But so, so this seems pretty prevalent in science fiction. And yet, even in this case, what you see are devices, robots, entities that have really quite high levels of social abilities. Right? Each of these examples, whether it's uh, so Hal on the bottom left there, we could argue whether that's a, a robot or not, but it's capable of natural language interaction to an extent that, you know, current systems really struggle with still. And so these capabilities are used for evil as well as good, right? Um, and of course, you know, social interaction doesn't necessarily have to imply um, you know, good interactions, right? Could be bad interactions too. Just because Terminator is trying to kill you, that doesn't mean it can't speak to you nicely to begin with. Um, so yeah, social interaction, that's the thing that, uh, um, that I'm interested in. And of course, there are so many facets that, you know, I've, I've mentioned a couple of already. Um, but I want to you know, focus on, you know, th three of those, let's say. So let's say you've got two people, um, two talking heads, as it were. There are three parts that I want to focus on that are pretty common across all of the examples I've just shown you um, so far. So the first of these is gaze, okay? These robots can employ the use of their eyes or similar substitutes um, to be able to indicate where they're looking, to indicate uh, joint attention with people, right? so orient their gaze and be able to highlight something in environment for a human to pay attention to. Um, they are all capable of some form of speech. Even in the case of something like Wally, there is some um, sort of sound-based interaction that can be used to indicate um, communication, right? They can it can transfer some degree of information, even if it's a sort of emotional-like state, um, by, by means of um, uh, verbal expressions. And the other one is that they're all capable of some form of um, um, thought, in the sense that they are capable of understanding what the person is doing that they're interacting with, they are capable of predicting what that person does next, just as we do very naturally as, as human beings. Now, these three things are, so this doesn't encompass the entirety of um, social interaction for people, but it does cover some of the very important points that, that, that we do, like I said, very naturally, unconsciously, um, and that we take advantage of not just for ourselves, but when we're observing other people as well. And yet these are the things that are assumed then that robots should be competent in and yet they're not really so gaze you know there are quite a few robots that are capable of some degree of gaze to take advantage of some of these things right uh, speech 
like I said, is actually very difficult to do. It's very easy to make a robot say something if you've predefined what it's going to say. When it comes to dialogue, however, so that means understanding what is said, understanding what the implications of that are, and being able to respond with something appropriate is far more difficult because not only do you have to uh, recognize what words are being said, but you have to also understand any underlying meaning there. Um, so this is getting closer to intention recognition, which I'll touch on in a moment as well. And so once you start thinking of you know, verbal interaction as involving deeper understanding, then this is where current systems, this is where current robots have you know, a big gap in their capabilities. Now, there are a lot of um, um, researchers around the world that are working very hard on, on all sorts of incredibly impressive systems um, to try to resolve this. And indeed, I've got a number of colleagues here, including uh, Heriberto, for instance, who is uh, one of the experts in the field in doing this, so dialogue management. But it's still an open problem in the sense that it's not solved yet. We don't have automated systems that are capable of understanding human dialogue, except in very constrained um, settings context. Um, the thinking part is also very difficult to achieve automatically. Just consider that you are standing in front of a person, right? Not even a group of people, just a person. You're watching them. Um, you have some understanding of what it is they're trying to achieve. Not just what actions they're performing, but what it is they're trying to achieve with those actions. Right? If you see them walking across a corridor, you can understand by the direction in which they're walking, for instance, what they might be choosing, uh, what they might be trying to get to. Right? Whether it's the stairs, you might then infer that they're trying to go upstairs or up a lift or go to the toilet. You know, things like that. These things are very difficult for a robot, a robotic system to be able to do automatically. Right? This is another thing that is very difficult to do because consider the sorts of things that you're taking into account. You're taking into account not just what that person is actually doing, right? It's the physical actions of that robot. You're also taking into account a huge, huge amount of context, right? The environmental context, so where that person is walking, the um, surrounding artifacts, so surrounding objects, signs, and so on. You need to be able to take that into account. But you also have a huge wealth of experience of your own, either actions that you have performed yourself or actions that you have watched other people perform that give you a very good indication of the sorts of things that are likely to happen or not. This sort of information is the sort of stuff that you have to put explicitly into a robot system if it is to achieve something even remotely similar with, uh, with even a remotely similar level of performance. So that's another aspect that is incredibly difficult to actually achieve in real robots. And yet these things are assumed to just be there in all the sorts of um, um, sci-fi robots that you might see. And it's the stuff that, because we don't really think about it, seems perfectly natural that robots should be able to do fairly easily because we do it so easily. Okay. So, there are a couple of aspects that robots can take advantage of, basically, right? So humans do things a lot, of, uh, do a, a huge amount of stuff automatically. Right? So I've already indicated some of the social interaction stuff that we uh, um, um, that we do automatically without really thinking about. But there's stuff that robots can take advantage of because humans have a propensity, a a pre-wired ability, as it were, uh, to be able to infer certain things about um, objects that they see. And this includes robots. So, for instance, let's look at a dot, right? So this is a dot, or a small circle on a screen. Um, this is another dot, small circle on a screen, and, you know, they're just arbitrary dots on a, on a, on a screen, right? Um, but as soon as I add a third thing, whether it's a line or another dot or so, it's pretty straightforward for us to infer that that could be a face, right? It's very easy to see that that's a face. Now, various robots take advantage of this. If you take the Keepon robot, for, for, for instance, and I believe there's a variant of this used in um, adverts for an energy company a couple of years ago, 
That has a very recognizable face, right? You give that to a child or to a fully grown adult, they'll e immediately be able to identify that that blob of sponge has a face. And yet it just consists, it, it, it is just comprised of three black dots, right? Uh, two eyes and a nose. No cameras in there necessarily, but, uh, um, but that's what we would infer when we look at that. Um, and that's something that we do all the time. We see faces in the environment, in the clouds, um, in sinks, in washing machines. We see these everywhere. Right, um, and that's an effect called pareidolia, which is the um, the um, us basically seeing shapes, particularly faces, um, in things that are not alive. Right, um, there are various explanations in terms of evolutionary history for for this reason, but that's what we do naturally. Right, we see something that could be a face, and we almost invariably will see it as a face. Even if they're very, very simple, you know, two dots on a line uh, or a circle or, or various shapes like that. So just the vis visual appearance of something will allow us as humans to ascribe almost immediately some form of almost agency to what are lifeless static objects. Right? So that applies to robots as well. So when you are, when we as roboticists are dealing with humans in the context of human robot interaction well we can take advantage of this because we already know that people will view this robot as being potentially capable of social interaction as soon as they recognize something even as um, um, such as a simple face right? so that's something we can take advantage of <clears throat> but it's not just visual appearance that people will um, take it that uh, will automatically infer or apply properties to in their minds it's also movement okay so all these pictures on on the that you see on the screen now are just static pictures and we already ascribe faces and hence you know the possibility of emotions and various um, 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 social interactivity uh, abilities but even if you just take very simple motions on shapes for instance you get a similar sort of effect so this is uh, quite a well-known video um i'm not going to say anything about it other than the fact that a brief description which is you can see two triangles and a circle and a couple of long thin rectangles moving around on a screen right and you can see that and yet as we going through this little animation and i hope you can see effectively you are creating a story in your mind you are attributing intentions feelings onto what are very simple two-dimensional shapes right you might for instance be viewing the big rectangle a uh, big triangle as a bit of a bully for the uh, little circle who's afraid and that the little triangle is trying to rescue the poor little circle all right and yet all you're really seeing are just a bunch of little shapes moving around on the screen yeah uh, we are doing all of the work here in terms of attributing agency in terms of attributing social behavior onto what is really simple shapes moving around on a screen okay so again in terms of robotics, we can and do take advantage of this um, by just being able to um, to say that you know basic movements, which are consistent with things that we would be able to um, expect to understand as humans. Well, if we apply those to robots, then that makes the um, the effect even stronger. So we combine this idea of uh, simple appearances, which suggest certain sort of um, uh, features such as faces, with simple movements, which can suggest, um, say, emotional state um, or intentions. And we already have the situation where people will ascribe quite complex capabilities to what may be really quite simple robots. And so, you know, one of our jobs as social robot um, designers is, or implementers, is to try to take advantage of these. But try to take advantage of these in a way that doesn't allow people to overestimate the capabilities of robots because if you can if if somebody meeting your robot for the first time 
immediately ascribes to it sorts of behaviours that we are simply not capable of doing, then that leads to quite a big disappointment when they realise that the robot isn't quite as complicated or as fancy as they think it is. So, you know, what sort of things can we do in terms of robotics? Right? I've, I've talked about being able to observe somebody and to, um, um, we as humans, observing people and understanding what they're trying to do. Um, and we use various information for that, most notably our eyes, right? We look at things, we can understand some of the context in which people are, um, um, are behaving. And so, you know, ideally we'd like robots to do something similar. So you've probably all come across the idea of RGBD, so using uh, Microsoft Connect, uh, for example, and various other manufacturers have made these as well. So you get depth images, um, you can integrate those with um, RGB images, uh, so normal colour pictures, for example. And so you can extract certain amounts of information from that. So skeleton extraction is a relatively uh, common procedure to do on depth images, so you can extract what where a person is, what pose they're doing, what sort of actions they're doing, all right? And so robots can do that, that's fine. Um, yes, occlusions sometimes cause some problems and so on, but for the whole, you can get skeletons. The question though is, well, what do you do next, all right? It's one thing being able to see where a person is and what a person is doing. You might recognize an action, for instance, but then, Think about the example I gave earlier, where you're watching somebody cross um, cross a corridor or a hall. Understanding what they are trying to achieve is a whole other problem, because if you know you're taking into account so much more information, including your prior experience, to be able to inform you as to what they might be doing. Whereas for a robot, if you just get something like this, which is just um, um, 2D, possibly 3D skeleton you still have to apply all of that understanding there. And that's something that we simply can't do yet. So the idea that um, you can reliably do um, intention recognition, so rec recognizing what the intention of an, of an observed person is, is a very difficult problem. Again, there are lots of people working on this, including um, um, one of my PhD students, Alex, and myself, but it's an unsolved problem, right? This is, uh, this is very difficult stuff. So that's RGBD. Um, then there's also there are all sorts of other sensors such as um, uh, laser scanners. So this is um, an example of an image of a laser scan from a car of a car driving down a street. So again, it is one thing to be able to recognize what the objects are there. It's quite another thing to be able to figure out what is the most appropriate thing to do next. Okay? That's where the, the, the real problem comes. Um, the unsolved problem comes, I mean. I mean, just being able to extract, just I say, um, objects and the surroundings and to see what is actually there, to be able to distinguish, for instance, between a tree and another car, or if you can see in the, uh, at the top of that image at the bottom there, um, the pedestrian crossing, just to be able to get that information is, is, is challenging, right? So there's some incredibly um, powerful, um, algorithms developed by a whole host of very, very clever people who enable just that, right? But what you do with that information to do decision making is is a whole other problem. <clears throat> and then something slightly closer to, to home, for instance, this is an example of one of our robots, uh, Linda, uh, moving around one of our former robotics um, labs. You know, you have this information from mapping. Right, so this, what you can see there in the background of um, the bottom image is a map of the environment that the robot is currently traveling around. You can see some waypoints, which indicates where the robot should go um, and what orientation the robot should be moving at. Right? And so this can be used for planning paths. It can be used for saying, um, giving information about where things are in the environment, which you can take into account when, um, when you're deciding what to do next. But again, just this on its own doesn't necessarily give you enough information to figure out what to do next. It doesn't necessarily give you an, enough information to figure out what people are doing within this environment. It's a help, but it's not enough on its own. So in terms of what I do then, so um, just to extend on what I said earlier about, uh, about what I do, what I'm 
interested in is specifically these aspects of social interaction that we as humans just assume that we do naturally without really thinking about it, but for which, as I hope I've shown you, requires a huge amount of underlying information processing. You're taking into account a huge amount of stuff in order to do even the simplest of things, like walk down a corridor in which there are other people already located. And so what I basically try and do is try and match together this idea of uh, psychology, so how humans think about things, how humans decide how to do things, how humans perform things like intention recognition and so on, and combine that with robotics, so artificial intelligence, um, um, cognitive robotics, even some of the developmental robotics that I started off doing um, in the context of robotics, and put them together, because it's where those things fit together that you get effectively the field of human-robot interaction, so that's HRI there. And that is well, what I do. So um, many of the things that I have worked on um, involve these small robots that you see, uh, these small now robots that you can see there. And they try to take into account various aspects of the human behavior of the people that they're interacting with and try to make use of some of those effects that I've mentioned before. So attribution of behavior or um, um, of agency as a result of movement, but also as a result of um, things such as pareidolia, so attribution of agency, uh, attribution of agency because somebody sees a face. So you can see these robots that I use are very simple faces. Um, and I put them, I've done primarily sort of educational applications. Okay, so having a robot interact with children, for example, and be able to, you know, help guide the children to learn about some topic better than if they were just learning by themselves, for instance. So it's a genuine interaction partner, not a robot that you are programming, but a robot that you interact with and in return will help you to learn about something. So, for example, I've done things on mathematics, um, on the top left, top right, you can see an example of um, uh, something that former PhD student Emmanuel did uh, a few years ago now, but learning about uh, ecosystems, so relationships between animals in this case, and the robot would act as a tutor to help the child learn about some of these uh, relationships within a simple ecosystem. And then, you know, more psychologically psychologically oriented studies. So on the bottom left, for instance, uh, examining um, executive functioning in children of various ages, um, and indeed even some um, um, involvement in autism therapy, where we have used robots to augment existing um, autistic interventions for social skills practicing, for example. So in each of these cases, what we're trying to do with the robot is to replicate some of those things that we take for granted as people, right? So the use of gaze, for example, um, trying the best we can to take into account what the children are actually saying, right? So understanding what they're saying and using that to try to make the robot behavior as effective as possible at maximizing learning for the people concerned. Okay, so that, that, that's some of the idea. Um, but it's not just with these sorts of robots that um, this sort of research can be applied. It's also the sorts of robots, uh, these sorts of robots. So I don't know whether you've seen um, um, seen this. So it's Linda's um, smaller or sister robot um, called Lindsay. And if you don't know, in the Collection Museum in Lincoln, uh, there is one of these robots that has been roaming the um, the museum floor for the past um, two and a half, three years now, not in pandemic times, unfortunately. Uh, so this is a project that's been run by um, uh, Professor Han Heider, Mark Han Heider, and his PhD student, Francesco. And so basically they've put in this completely autonomous robot tour guide. So you can request a tour of various exhibits by the robot and it will show you around and explain some things um, as you're going on. And so one of the key um, or one of the interesting things about this project is, is that it gives us as social robotics researchers an opportunity to augment the behavior of these robots, which are perfectly capable now in terms of uh, navigation and so on, 
but to augment that, to improve the experience of the people involved by endowing it with some more social skills. So whether you can see uh, this in the image or not, or, or not, it doesn't really have a movable head, but the eyes inside that glass dome can move around and so can look at things. Right? You can make use of gaze to um, augment the things that the robot says in order to, you know, make take advantage of some of those behaviors that people take for granted. Right. So if a robot looks at something, you're more likely to orient your gaze in the same direction. So you can um, um, highlight certain artifacts over other ones right? because this robot doesn't have arms, so it can't point. Um, eye gaze can perform a similar sort of function. So it's those sorts of things that we are trying to research and apply to platforms like this so that people who are not used to robots are able to interact with them in ways that they already know how to do, right? They don't have to learn something special to interact with these social robots. The idea is that they just use whatever they, um, whatever competencies they use for interacting with people anyway, or already. And so, you know, the technologies that underlie this are varied and complex and so on. And I'm not going to go into those technologies um, now, the sort of underlying AI, um, machine learning and so on. Um, but one of the other questions of principle that we should be thinking about is not just, you know, what we can do, right, because there are lots of things we could do, but also the things that whether we should do things, how we should change the way we do things with these social robots um, as a consequence of, you know, ethical considerations. And this particularly applies to sort of social robots because we are taking advantage of people's propensities to interact with these things as they would with other people right and so it's for that reason that we need to consider these ethical ethical concerns from the outset and i personally at least am pleased to say that the majority of the researchers that i have had the pleasure to work with or alongside or or, or so on in the past do genuinely take these considerations seriously so let's have a quick look so i will have a quick look at just a couple of um, applications now just to see you know the sorts of things that need to be taken into consideration as well as you know highlighting some of the things um, some of the research that's been going on here in lincoln as well as um, with our collaborators elsewhere so first in terms of social robotics there's a, a, a big push or has been a big push in terms of being able to help support the elderly, whether in their own homes or in assisted living community and so on. Um, in fact, we've had a couple of projects here in the past in which uh, people like Professor Hanheider and uh, uh, Dr. Bellotto have been involved in the past. Um, and so the idea is that you have robots that can assist elderly people, whether it's in their own homes or in a care facility and so on. Um, and yet there are some concerns in the public about having this happen, quite rightly so. Um, there are every few years, the um, European Commission does a very large scale survey across Europe um, in which you know people are asked about various aspects of technology and science as potentially impacting their lives. So there were a couple of few years ago on robotics, social robotics, general robotics. And so one of the outcomes of this was that people were generally fairly skeptical about having robots assist the elderly or even assist um, children in school. Right? So there's general skepticism about that. Now, this is in the general pub public where people naturally don't have very much experience with robotics. And so we as roboticists need to be very careful about this. Right? We can't just put things into people's homes for the sake of it, for the sake of a science, however interesting that is, without taking into serious consideration the way that people feel about this, um, um, people's um, uh, people's rights. You know, we have responsibilities and obligations as researchers, as roboticists, um, to take that into account rather fundamentally as well. And so, 
a lot of robotics researchers alongside the sort of technical work that they do will also do things such as you know the sort of standard outreach stuff that you do in science anyway but also they will run um, um, things like um, co-design workshops involving people in the design of robots and their behaviors you'll see people run sort of focus groups to try to understand what people really think about the robots after they've had some experience with them and so generally and, and this is um, a bit of a generalization, of course, because there's a huge amount of um, 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 low level detail that I'm skimming over here, of course. But generally, as people are involved in robots, adults and children alike, as they get some experience with the sorts of things that robots can and can't do. And as they can see the way that roboticists work with their robots and with the people that they're trying to uh, help with these robotic systems, you typically see that these people start to become much more positive about the potential applications of robotics in their domain. All right? So I'm not suggesting for one moment that this addresses all of the concerns that people have with robotics as being applied, uh, applied in the real world, in various real world contexts, but it is in a way comforting that we can get to a situation where we get more general acceptance by involving the general public more. And I think, to be honest, this goes beyond robotics um, into any sort of generation of new technologies, especially where you have interactive technologies which are intended to be put in front of and with and alongside um, humans, especially when it's in their homes um, and so on. So that's one aspect that I uh, wanted to briefly consider. Another aspect which has been in the news a lot more um, over the past few years at least, not always for good reasons, has been this idea of autonomous cars. So here are just some arbitrary pictures of autonomous cars, an autonomous public transport uh, system in um, um, Germany, I believe that's the, that is. Um, and so here... This might seem a bit strange when um, um, when considering social robots, but remember an example I gave earlier. If you're crossing a street, if you're crossing a road at a uh, pedestrian crossing, um, and a car will car slows down to stop, more likely than not, most people will make try to make some form of eye contact with the driver. Now, why do you do this? You do this quite naturally. It's almost um, um, seeking reassurance that the driver has seen you and won't start to drive off as you're crossing the road. right? And yet that very small interaction is incredibly important. right? So you have confirmation through a social signal that you can proceed with the behavior that you planned crossing the road. The driver has confirmation that the person who's about to cross the road is actually going to cross the road. Right? So there's a lot of information there just contained within a simple exchange of, um, of gaze. Now, if you think about an autonomous car, if it's driving itself, well, there's no driver. If, the pers if there is a person sitting in the driver's seat, well, you know, that is... Um, 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 not that that person is not necessarily paying attention because they are um, assuming that the car is capable of handling itself. And so a pedestrian may get quite confused as to, you know, in terms of the lack of that expected social response. And there are indeed various people, lots of people working on autonomous cars, um, including um, um, Charles, uh, Dr. Charles Fox, who's a colleague of mine here in Lincoln. Lots of people working on that, but there are also people working on social signals involving autonomous cars, in, in, including um, um, Charles to a certain extent. But people looking at, you know, putting little eyes on the car to make sure that you can have that sort of reciprocal gaze interaction with um, with the car as well. Um, and this is a non real expected consideration when you're dealing with something like an autonomous car. Yet this idea of social signal signaling is so pervasive and so fundamental in human behavior in the real world that it's a serious consideration for these, uh, for these sorts of cars. They're not typically taken into account in, in current autonomous car systems, um, but at the moment you don't have fully autonomous cars on our roads. Um, and so that's something that is likely to come up in future. Whether it becomes something that's explicitly legislated for, I'm, I'm not sure, but that is certainly something that uh, um, should be taken into consideration or is being taken into consideration as we go into the future. 
Okay, so what I have done here in this you know, relatively brief talk is give you just a very, very scratch the surface overview of social robots and how that contrasts with the way of, of, of actual social robots and how that contrasts with the way they're portrayed in the media, in films, in popular science and so on. For me, at least, that's 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 exciting because there is a huge potential to explore a significant amount more. There is a huge potential to improve our auto autonomous robotic systems to an extent that they can interact with people much more naturally in the real world. So in terms of research, that is a tremendously interesting challenge. It's also, also tremendously interesting for me because part of the challenge is understanding how people work is understanding how people do things, why people do things the way they do, and to be able to put that onto robotics. So for me personally, robots is not just as a tool to help people in the real world, but also as a tool that can help us to understand how people do what they do. So I've done some studies in the past, for instance, on, on basically trying to understand people, doing psychology studies, where a robot is a tool that can enable me to, um, um, to explore that in a scientifically rigorous manner. So hopefully that's piqued your interest a little. Hopefully that's piqued your interest to the extent that you will want to look at social robots some more. But for now, I have said what I wanted to say. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And uh, that's all from me. Goodbye.